Safety Church. Good morning and happy Father's Day. As everyone comes trickling in, I have a few announcements for you this morning. We are happy to have you here today and would love if you would fill out a connection card in one of the seats in front of you. If you have any prayer requests, you can put that on there as well and someone will reach out to you. You can return the cards to the connection table in the foyer or put them in the offering basket. We invite you to join us for the 75th anniversary of the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference. That's a mouthful. It's at the River's Edge Convention Center July 10th through the 13th. There'll be activities for kids and some activities for adults as well. You can register at cccusa.com. The registration deadline is June 27th. There's more information in your bulletin. Dr. Pat is our missionary of the month. Would you write her a note of encouragement? We've provided some cards in the foyer and a photo of her um, at the front table. You can drop them in the box beside the picture. We also have a picture of a young man named Gavin out there. He's only 17. His birthday was last week. Gavin recently had a heart transplant and has some complications along with that. He's really in need of prayer for healing. If you'd like to fill out a card for him, wishing him a happy birthday, maybe some words of encouragement or just some prayer, it would be really meaningful. His card and pictures are in the foyer as well. We are sending a group to Israel this February and want you to join. This is a trip of a lifetime. It's the best experience for you and for your children ages 12 and older. Um, there's more information in your bulletin again. Vacation Bible School sign-up is up and running. VBS will run from August 7th to the 10th. It's an incredible outreach opportunity for our community. You can go to our website to register your children and sign up as a volunteer. It takes a lot of volunteers to make this happen, so please sign up. Will you please stand and join me in prayer over the dads in our presence today? Dear God, we thank you for the gift of dads in this life. We thank you that you are our greatest dad ever, our father, and we know that you cover us in your great love. We pray for your blessing, favor, and strength over every dad in our world, for those who are seeking to walk closely with you in a dark world, and for those who just need to be reminded that you are real. We ask for your renewed courage, for your boldness, for your spirit to fill them. Make them always aware and alert of the schemes of the enemy. We ask that you keep their footsteps firm and guard their way. We ask that you help them to always stand strong, to be men of faith, to say no to what is wrong, and to say yes to what is right. We ask that you fill their hearts with love, compassion, joy, faithfulness, and cover their lives with great peace. Lord, we lift up those who are hurting this Father's Day. If they have lost their earthly fathers, we pray your Holy Spirit would comfort them, for you are the God of all comfort. And Lord, if they didn't have a father, would you continue to work in their lives and fill that void? You watch over them and understand their loss. Be their father when earthly fathers fail. Show them love and guidance and help them to know a father's love through your love, providence, and care. Lord, we pray that you would raise up mighty men, godly men in this generation who would know and honor you with their entire lives. We pray that they would stand firm in the faith, walk wisely, and follow after you. May they grow in their love and passion for you, for their families, and in the calling to follow you above all else. Thank you for dads who fight for their families, who do battle in prayer over those they love. Thank you, God, that your word is true. We hold fast to you today. We choose you to immerse our lives in your truth. We know that you are with us always and cover us in your power and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing and join us for worship.
hiding, the reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 my heart has been in your sight long before my first breath. Running into your arms is running to life from death. And I feel this run. Your mercy is calling out Just as I am, you pull me in And I know I need you now My heart has been in your sight Long before my first breath Running into your arms Is running to life So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, I fall in the grace. I'm done with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, It's who you are. It's who you are. 
seated. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, how true the words that we just sang are. You are a good, good father. You are perfect in every way, how awesome it is that we have you as our Heavenly Father. So Lord, on a day like today, we want to celebrate. Lord, we also want to remember those here, Lord, who that's not their experience in terms of their earthly life. We lift them up today for your comfort and your care, Lord, for those who didn't have the blessing of a a good earthly father. We want them to know your comfort and and your care and find in you that perfect heavenly Father, Lord, that you are. And God, we celebrate today these dads who are here, Lord, who are faithful, who are seeking to be godly men, seeking to be faithful men in the midst of a culture that really no longer honors men and Christian men in particular, Lord, are attacked on many different fronts. And I thank you for these men who are here today who are doing the best they can to love their families well, to lead their families well, to to be faithful men. And I pray they'd be encouraged today and and feel the the love that we have for them and the appreciation that we have for them and, and the job that they are doing. Lord, I pray that they might be encouraged today in our time of worship. So, Lord, we are just grateful today, grateful for these godly fathers and, and others who couldn't be here today because of vacation and all kinds of different issues. Pray your blessing on them as well. God, we just want to remember today, again, those who are hurting and looked around this morning, and I see people who were here who've experienced great loss recently, who've lost a, a brother, a father, a, a husband, a mother, a grandmother, Lord, just in a quick look around. I, I saw people who were here worshiping, and yet their hearts are heavy, and, and they have experienced great loss, and we lift them up to you today. Pray for your comfort and we pray for your care. We pray that you would place within them that deep hope that we have because of the truth of the gospel and and the power of the truth of the resurrection that they might, in the midst of their grief, know your comfort. So Lord, we just dedicate this service to you. This is the day you've made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we are thankful for the chance to gather with the people of God today and to experience your love, your acceptance, your forgiveness, and encouragement and support from one another as we gather. And Lord, we now pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, all of our kids can be dismissed to go to Children's Church. Our leaders in the back, grab your Bible and taking a break from Matthew today, which may make some of you happy. Last week uh, we talked about the reality of the devil and spiritual warfare, and I'd much rather talk about uh, how to be a grace-based dad. So that's why that's what we're talking about today. So grab your Bible and turn to the very back of your Bible, First uh, John. It's our text for this morning, chapter 3, verse 1. And I just want to say a couple things as, as we begin. First of all, thank all you dads for being here. This is usually the lowest attendance of the year for every church. <laughs> and the dads are like, I'm not going to church today. Pastor's just going to yell at me for not being a good dad. So I think it has a lot more to do with the summer break and people finally have a chance to get on vacation and, and uh, get away and have some fun with the family, which I'm, I'm all for. But it, it always uh, used to bug me as a young pastor when I knew that Mother's Day was one of the highest attendances of the year besides Easter and Father's Day the lowest, and I could never quite put that together. But I'm going to say it's more to do with vacation, right? Yeah. But, for, <laughs> but for you dads who are here, thank you for coming, and uh, you, you are uh, uh, an encouragement to your pastor. So uh, my hope today is that you be encouraged. You know, you were brave enough to come on Father's Day. So I got no rocks to throw at you dads and granddads. I want to encourage you. And uh, so last week we were dealing with uh, Matthew's story and uh, the end of chapter 8, if you were here or you remember, and we talked about a man in the grip of evil, the demon-possessed man that God uh, marvelously liberated. And so this week I thought it's Father's Day. I want to talk to you about a man in the grip of grace. Now dads, look at me. Granddads, pay attention, all right? I need you to be really alert in case you're not caffeinated yet because there's going to be a test at the end of the sermon, all right? I have five points, and they, they uh, match the word grace, G-R-A-C-E. Each of the points begins with that letter. So uh, I took a lot of time in putting this together, Dad, so that not only would you hear it, but it could become a part of your fathering and your grandfathering. And if you want to take some notes uh, or go back and listen to it and take notes, some of you prefer to do that, uh, I, I want this to become a part of your prayer life as a father and grandfather. What I'm going to say today can really help you in your parenting and grandparenting, but you're going to have to focus and you're going to have to engage with me in the sermon a bit. So take some notes and, and uh, let, let's uh, jump into it, talk about what it looks like to be a, a grace-based kind of dad or a man in the grip of God's grace. But let's look at our text this morning. We're going to look at some other verses, but we'll just start here. We've already sang the truth of this verse, but let me point you to 1 John 
chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Man, there's so much in that verse. We see God as described as a God who not only loves us, but who lavishes love on us. And it tells us why so many people in the world don't understand Christian family, a Christian father, a family that's trying to order themselves under God's word, that they don't understand that because they don't know him. They don't have a relationship with him, and they're rejecting the truth, and they're rejecting a relationship with this God who simply wants to lavish his love on those who will receive him. Now, dads, if you're like me, I I think it's normal on a day like today, if you're honest, uh, as a Christian dad especially, to have this feeling or this thought that I just don't measure up. If you're honest about it and you know all the things that you want to be doing as a, as a Christian dad and, and you know all the things that, that are involved in that, and unfortunately, then you look around at what we call the super dads. Those are those dads maybe in your family or dads that you work with or maybe a dad in the church or someone you're aware of, and it's just like, man, I just can't be like that guy. He's just got it all together and doesn't seem to struggle at all with being a Christian dad, and yet that's not the reality for me. I mean, he has family devotions once a week with his kids, and he prays with his wife most days, and he's a very financial savvy dude and uh, has lots of money, and he's already got you know, accounts for his kid's college account, and on and on we could go. I mean, the list just goes on and on. So it's natural for dad sometimes just to feel the weight of that and just think, well, you know, I'm coming up short when I look at this list, so a better strategy for me is just to ignore it, to not think about it. And unfortunately, some dads do that. They just forget about it all together. Well, I've got an answer for you, dads. That's not the answer to ignore it, and that, that, that's not going to be helpful. But here's what I'd like you to think about with me this morning, dads and granddads, is this. What is a Christian dad, a Christian granddad supposed to do? What are they supposed to be like? What what does it actually look like? And you would like to have a step-by-step instruction manual. I know, I'm the same way. You think, well, why didn't God just give us like this instruction manual and I could just look at it from time to time and say, okay, I'm doing well here, I'm not doing so so well here. But God did something entirely different for you dads and granddads. He didn't give you a step-by-step instruction manual. What did he do? He gave you himself. He gave you himself. He says, I am a God who wants to lavish love on you. And then Jesus Christ came and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, we follow Jesus around the Gospels. That's why we're taking so long to get through the Gospel of Matthew, because we're literally trying to see God more clearly. And if you see God more clearly and follow him more closely, that is the secret to being the kind of dad and granddad that you'd really like to be. Do I really want to see God as he really is, not a God I want to make up, the good guy, big guy upstairs, but this holy and gracious God, do I really want to get to know him more intimately and walk with him more closely? Because it is the most important question you'll make in your life, dads, granddads. Most important question you'll ever make. I just want to tell you something. I appreciate all of you who are making money. We need it. I ask for it. God bless you. It's a gift God has given you. I'm not against that. But I will tell you this. You're not going to take one dollar of that to heaven with you. All the things that we value so much sometimes as men are things we can't take to heaven with us. What is the one thing you can take to heaven with you? Your children. Your spouse. Your grandchildren. That is the priority, and so we look at Jesus, and we see God gave us himself, and if we'll look at him, and that is at the heart of what it means to be kind of a grace-based kind of dad. And so I just encourage you this morning, rather than just kind of feeling bad about all the things you're not doing, to begin to think about what you need to do as a dad, listen, What you need to do as a dad and a granddad is have a grace-based view of what being a father is, and it's this. I want to love my children and my spouse 
in the same way that God has loved me. Now, if you forget everything else, that's it. I want to, as a grace-based dad, as a man in the grip of God's grace, I want to be the kind of husband and father that loves my wife and loves my children in the same way that God loves me. And then you step back and think about, well, how has God loved me? Does he show you love? Yeah. Does he show you acceptance? Yes. Does he show you forgiveness? Yes. Does he show you patience? Yes. Does he delight in you? Yes. That's how you're to love your spouse and love your children. Now, that's a lot harder than a step-by-step manual. I'm just going to tell you. That's not easy. That's easy to remember. It's very hard to live out. And I will just argue this. It's impossible to live out without the help of the Holy Spirit. It can't be done. Because you are too selfish, just like me. You are too sinful, just like me. You are too distracted, just like me, to do that and be that kind of a husband or dad without the help of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to keep our eyes on God to do this. So are you ready, guys? So i got five things for you today, and it's going to be a test at the end. So wake up, okay? Five things. G-R-A-C-E. Did I spell it right? Grace. I did spell it right. So here's the G. Are you ready? As a dad, you need to be generous in your expressions of love to your children. You might want to write that down. That's the G for being a grace-based dad. You need to be generous in your expressions of love to your children. Say, well, I tell my kids once that I love them, and if I ever change my mind, I'll let them know. No. (laughs) That's not what we're talking about. That's not how God treats you. God reminds you every time you come to the communion table how much he loves you. I don't know what you think about it, communion. But that's a great thing to think about if you're not thinking about that. When you eat that bread and drink that cup, I don't know if there could be any better of a description of what love is that Christ loved you so much that he died so that you could be in right relationship with him. So be generous in your expressions. That's the G. We're going to come back to it. G, grace. This is going to be an easy lesson for you to remember. Then you can make it a matter of prayer. I'm going to tell you how to do that. And kind of an evaluation tool. Write down this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know it well, verses 4 through 7. You say, well, what does that look like, Pastor Alvin, for me to be generous in my expressions of love to my children? Well, here's what it looks like, men. Love is patient. Matter of fact, as I'm reading this, just put your name in there in the blank. Instead of love, just say your, your name to yourself. And think of how you are with your children. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Men, listen to that. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now listen, none of us are going to hit that on the mark 100% every week, but that's the goal. We want to be loving with our kids. We want to be patient with them. We want to be not keeping records of all the mistakes they're making along the way because they will make mistakes. Trust me. They will break your heart sometimes. But we want to love them well. So look at that list sometimes and, and reflect on it. God's love comes into your life, men. That's why it's about getting to know God and see God and experience God. As you get to know God and see him and experience him, that love will enter into you and work through you into the lives of your spouse and your children. God's love is to come into your life, men, and then to work through you to be a blessing to your children. And you're going to have to make a decision, men. You're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to be okay with a mundane walk with God? Or am I going to seek an intimate walk with God? You're going to have one or the other. Mundane is, yeah, I show up at church, you know, support the church. Volunteer some, you know, give them my time once a year, show up at a men's Bible study, you know. I, I do some stuff. That's a mundane walk with God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a daily, intimate walk with God. 
a daily intimate walk with God where there's a desire in your heart, there's a fire in your heart, there's a hunger in your heart that you want to move closer to God. My dad used to lead us in a song at our church when I was a kid. And he not only sang it, but he lived it. And I'm so glad he did. And he loved that song, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. You probably never heard of it unless you're over 60. <laughs> I saw Bonnie smile. <laughs> I think Bonnie's 63, right? Bonnie is that? <laughs> uh, Google it, you know, that's what the kids say, right? <laughs> My wife said the kids don't say that. Google it anyway. Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Man, that, that's what you want in your heart. And again, I'm not here to throw rocks at you. My gosh, you're here. Bless you. Thank you. I don't want any man to walk out of here today feeling condemned. I do want to challenge you that this is really important that you be this kind of a dad. And you and I will never make it if in our heart we don't have a desire to really walk close to Jesus. I hope that's your heart, man. If it's not, just acknowledge it to God. Say, God, I have to admit, I'm settling for a mundane walk with you. It's not that exciting. It's not that passionate. It's not that authentic. But would you birth within me a desire to even know you more intimately? I want to tell you, man, God will answer that prayer. If you'll be humble enough to pray that kind of prayer, I feel kind of dry, God. I just... You know, I love you, I love my family, but I just don't really feel like I'm walking close to you, that I'm experiencing you in any significant way on a daily basis. God, would you just give me a desire to walk closer to you? God will answer that prayer. Pray it. Acknowledge it. Be, you know, don't flatter yourself. Be honest about it. How can you be more generous with your kids? I hope that's a question you'll think about this week. And I'll just tell you this, if you want to be generous with your kids, you know this. There's all kinds of things I could share with you. I'm just going to share with you one sentence. You want to know how to be more generous with your kids, spend time with your children. When I was an early pastor, I, I used to laugh. I would hear men come and say, hey, what are you doing this week? Oh, I've got to babysit the kids. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you don't babysit your own kids. That's your responsibility. <laughs> That's not just mom's duty to watch the kids all the time. You're not babysitting your kids. You're getting a chance to spend some time with your kids. I used to tell men who'd be off hunting, you know, and chasing elk in Montana or something when we were out west and coming back bragging about all this stuff, and, and I'm all for it, especially when they give me some of the elk. But I would challenge the men. I'd say, look, I'm glad you went hunting. You need to do stuff, have fun with the guys. But When's the last time you gave your wife the same amount of money you spent on this elk trip and gave her three or four days to go have fun with her friends and just say, hey, I got it, I'll take care of the kids? It's interesting, men, how we think sometimes. You know, be generous. Spend time with your kids. They, they love it. They might not always acknowledge it, but trust me, they love it, and, and they will remember that the rest of their life. Number two, are you ready? So what's the G, men? Look at me. Generous what? Generous with what? Love. Expressions of love with your children. I think you got it. One more time. Generous with what? Expressions of love with your children. Okay, I think you got it. All right. R. The R in grace men stands for responsible. As grace-based men, grace-based dads, granddads, we want to be responsible to provide for the real needs, and I underline that, real needs of my children. Matthew 6, 31 and 32 says this. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Dads, our calling is to provide for our family. There are verses in Scripture that say, if you don't take care of your own family, that's worse than just being a pagan. And I think most of you men, if not all of you, do a good job in this area. Most men that I know, Christian men, are hardworking. They provide for their family. They, they, they get out there and they take that seriously and, and they're seeking to be a good provider for their family and, and that's awesome. And men, let me tell you what, what's good about that. When you provide for your family, when you work hard and you provide for your family and they're secure in their food needs, their shelter needs, their real needs. I'm not talking about desires or wishes or wants. I'm talking about their real needs. A, a roof over their head, food on the table, clothes to wear, 
basics of life. When you model that, as most of you men do, you are showing them that they can trust God to provide for them, and they begin to look at their heavenly Father as someone who will provide for them throughout their life, long after you are gone. So how well are you doing in these two areas so far? How would you rate yourself, 1 to 10, generous with expressions of love, responsible to provide for the real needs of my family? I tell you, growing up, I was just always surprised, in case you're wondering, I'm halfway through my notes, so hang in there. That never stopped me, because there's always these side roads I like to run you down, because there's beautiful things on these side roads that that I want you to see that aren't the main road of this sermon, so I'm going to try to stay on the main road today. We're already halfway done with my notes, so that's good for you. But my dad taught me this so well. I don't think my dad, and he was a bishop of 100 churches for the last 26 years of his ministry career, I don't think he ever made more than $60,000 in his life. In a lot of years, I saw his Social Security statement when we were going through, my sister and I, all my dad's possessions and cleaning things out and deciding what had to be chunked and what we were going to keep. I looked at his Social Security record. Oh, my goodness. We were poor. I never knew it till I, till I looked back. I thought, how in the world did we survive on that? I mean, my goodness. But you know what my dad taught me? He totally trusted God. In God's economics, it, it just it's amazing. Things that somehow just happened into our family, happened into our life. And my dad was a hard worker and did little side things on the side that I never knew about until I I became older so that our needs would be met. And it was wonderful that my dad provided for me. And he turned down toward the last 15 years of his ministry. Elders, if you're here, put your hand in your ears. My dad turned down three raises in the last 15 years of his ministry. Now, I'm never going to do that, so elders, just don't even think that. I'm never going to turn down a raise. My dad turned down three raises. And when I was in college, I heard he did that. I said, Dad, what is wrong with you? These people love you. You're doing a good job. Why, why, would, you, why would you turn down a raise? And you know what he said to me? My dad was the most contented man I've ever met in my life, and I've been around lots of great men. He was the most contented man. You know what he said to me when I tried to coach him up a little bit? Dad, you you don't turn down raises. That's not how it works. He said, son, our family's doing fine. My dad was thin, unlike your pastor. He wasn't my biological dad, but I had a good role model. He he was thin, and people would often say, Pastor Helms, you, you need to eat more. He'd be at a potluck. My dad's breakfast, you want to hear this? He lived to be 92. Here was my dad's breakfast almost every day of his life. One biscuit, one fried egg, one piece of bacon, hot black coffee. That's it. Almost most of his life, his lunch wasn't. He was very physical. He built three churches. He was never in the office. He was a handy guy. He didn't study a lot. He was more of an exhorter. He was out with the people. He might show up and mow your grass if you're on vacation. You would have loved him. You know what his lunch was most days? Two boiled eggs. Two small pieces of cheese, two crackers, and hot black coffee. (laughs) People would come to say, Pastor Helms, you need to eat more. You're skinny. You know what he would say to them? I "I ate just enough. I ate just enough. What am I saying? God's economics is unbelievable. The things that happen in our family. and My dad taught me about real needs versus wants and wishes and all these desires that we have, and, and he lived that way his entire life. He was content. Man, you need to live that way. Number three, so the G men, are you listening? You're going to get out here quicker if you stay with me. The G stands for what? Generous in your expressions of love. The R stands for what? Responsible for what? Meet the real needs of your family. Provide for the real needs of your family. You're doing good. All right, what's the A stand for? Anybody know? You don't. The A stands for awareness of the threats to my children. Awareness of the threats that my children face. Psalm 61 verses 3 and 4 says this. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Men, you need to know what are the threats that your children face. 
And those threats change depending on what age they are. Your children will have a particular set of threats that they face in their environment based on what their age is. And men, you need to be aware of that. There are some conversations the mom cannot have with the child. Doesn't mean they can't, but it's just not going to go as well. There's some conversations, men, that you need to have with your children, and especially in addressing the threats that are a part of what they're working through at that particular stage of their life. And they need to know that you are their protector. I often pray for people when they come up for prayer. I'll pray for protection. I'll pray for direction. I'll pray they'd have a sense of God's presence with them in their life. And fathers, grandfathers, this is what you need to pray for your children and communicate with them. You're their protector. You help give them direction. You help them to understand the sense of God's presence. And men, if you're not living this out, how are they going to figure it out? That's why I started by saying you have to pray and ask God to give you a desire to walk close to him because as you walk close to him, it comes through you to your kids so that they will have confidence that not only is God their heavenly father, their protector, but you are their protector. You can offer them wisdom and direction. You don't have that wisdom and direction if you're not close to God and in his word. That's where it comes from. And assure them that God's presence is going to be with them just as God's been with you through all the ups and downs of your life. And you've seen God work mightily in all kinds of situations. So God will be with them when you're not there. Aware of all of the different kinds of threats. What kind of threats do your kids face? Let me give you a few. These are just kind of general things. Let me give you a few. One threat they make is poor decision making. I don't know if you know this, but kids and teens aren't great at making good decisions all the time. And you need to be aware of that. Just like when you were a kid or teen, you didn't make good decisions all the time. One of the things that I talked to my kids about as they were growing up again and again was this phrase. I wanted them to hear it, remember it, use it, make good decisions. Make good decisions. And underneath that phrase to them, they knew what I meant. What would dad think about this? When they're out there and the pressure's on and they're being tempted to do this, that, and the other, when it's a challenge, I wanted that to ring in their head. What does dad say? Oh, make good decisions. Okay, I'm about to get in the car with someone who's inebriated. I know they've been drinking and, you know, five kids pile in the car. I want my kid to be the one that says, you know what? I think I'm going to do something different. Make good decisions. You need to have those kind of conversations, men, with your children. Don't wait for them to get in the heat of the moment and figure out, you know, what are you going to do on a date? you got to make that decision ahead of time. Where is that line? What's appropriate? What's not appropriate? Don't just assume they're going to know that. Man, you got to have those conversations with your kids. Don't just assume they're going to know the right decision when everybody's out at the party and uh, half the kids are blasted and the one driving is not doing too well either. And your kid needs to have the ability to stand up and say, no, I'm not doing this. Make good decisions. That's a threat. That's literally a physical threat for your child. Don't ignore those kinds of conversations. Don't leave those conversations all to mom, men. Those are conversations you and I need to have. All the immorality that's out there that they're being bombarded with. uh, Real enemies, uh, actual abusers out there that they need to know how to handle certain situations if someone is being inappropriate with them. We have to protect them. We have to warn them. We have to be there to make sure those threats are being addressed. And parents, you can do this. Most of you parents do a pretty good job at this, I would guess. But learn to ask your kids deeper questions. Here would be a real helpful thing for both, both of you parents, mom and dad. Learn to ask your kids, especially as they get older, deeper questions. What we tend to ask is, where did you go? Who are you with? That's not a question that's going to engage a very deep conversation with your child. Learn to go a little bit deeper with them. Learn to ask questions like, hey, you are at so-and-so's house. How are things at that house? Open up a conversation. You're going to be able to gauge threat. Is this a threat? Is this a safe place? Do I need to be concerned about this? Am I going to have to get involved with this? How, how, did your, how, does, how does your friend act when, when they made that decision? Do you, do you think that was a good decision your friend made? Let them open up and defend the idea Ask them those kinds of questions. Ask them this question. When's the last time you talked to your friend about the Lord? 
why do we think that we have to wait till our kids get grown up before they start acting like Christians? Well, did, did you ever talk to your friend about the Lord? Did you ever invite them to youth group? You know? Go deeper with these questions. Be aware of the threats. The, the kids have all kinds of threats out there. The false teaching that's out there, the media bias, they're getting bombarded with truth claims that are not true, that are not biblical. This whole month is about that. They're getting waylaid at school. They're getting waylaid sometimes by their friends. They're getting waylaid by the culture. Parents, they need you to stop and talk to them about that. How are you processing Pride Month? This is a challenge for you. What do we think about that as believers? What, what's a good way for us to process this untruth that our culture is throwing you know, at people all the time, making you feel like you're a horrible person if you don't bow the knee and, and uh, agree with the lies that are being propagated, all the social media stuff. Some of that is very toxic, as you know. Threats. So G stands for generous in your expressions of love. R stands for responsible to meet the real needs of your children. And A stands for what? Aware of the threats that your children face. Men, you can turn this into a prayer thing. You can begin to take these points and make them a matter of prayer. First of all, you start with adoration. God, I thank you that you or my Heavenly Father are generous in the way that you show me love. God, I, I, I thank you that you meet my real needs. God, I thank you that you offer me protection and direction and help me to be aware of the things that are threatening me. You start out, man, just by adoring God. Remember who he is. And then you confess, God, here's why I'm falling short as a dad. God, I'm not taking this seriously enough. It's been a long time since I've had a heart-to-heart -heart with my kids. God, I, I just repent of that, and would you give me a desire to do that and to pay attention to that? And then Thanksgiving, God, I thank you that I had a dad, a coach, a mentor, a teacher, a father figure in my life who did this for me. And then make it a matter of supplication, A-C-T-S. God, would you help me to do better in this area of my life? Again, man, I'm not here to throw rocks at you. I want to encourage you, but this is serious stuff. We have to do it. We can't ignore it. We can't let mom do it. We, we need to do it, man. So I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you that this is doable, that this will help you. And I'm giving you just a simple tool that you can remember that will help you. And then the C, you can tell we're getting close to the end. The C is consistent. Consistent. Men, be consistent in pointing your children to the importance of following Jesus. Be consistent and understanding the importance of pointing your children to follow Jesus. Man, I'm so thankful for my dad. I looked back, you know, at, at, we were going through my dad's house, and my dad didn't throw away a lot of stuff. He wasn't a hoarder, but man, oh man, there was a lot, a lot of stuff my sister and I went through. And a lot of it was just stuff that needed to be thrown away or whatever. But, well, there's some treasures there. And I found some cards that I had written to him for Father's Day that he kept all these years. Children, don't forget that. My 92-year-old dad had kept a card that I wrote to him for Father's Day when I was 17 years old. And I went back and read that card. I thought about reading it, but I was afraid I'd cry and lose it. So I said, no, I'm not doing that. But essentially what I was telling him was, Dad, I'm so thankful that you're a godly man. And I'm so thankful that the dad people see behind the pulpit is the dad we see in our home. And even though you're not going to leave me a lot of earthly treasure, you've left me something so much more important, heavenly treasure that I will always cherish and be grateful to you for. I wrote that as a 17-year-old young man, seen in my dad, the stuff I'm talking to you about today. And he kept that card all those years. Man, this stuff matters. This is important. We need to be consistent in pointing our kids to Jesus. I, I didn't have to wonder what a, a man who loved Jesus looked like. I, I lived with a man who loved Jesus, and he was not perfect. My dad wasn't perfect. That's not the point. None of us are going to be perfect. None of us are going to hit the mark. None of us are going to be tens. I'm not asking you to try to be a ten. I'm saying maybe shoot for a seven. <laughs> maybe even an eight as you get older. 
Because this stuff matters so much. And so often we're so concerned about our kids being great in sports. We're so concerned about our kids getting the best education. We're, we're so concerned about our kids having a career. And the last thing on our list sometimes is, is my kid walking close with Jesus? And man, your kids are going to get that from you. It's more caught than taught. I didn't have to wonder about prayer. My dad took me to prayer meetings when I was a kid. He showed up at prayer meeting. I learned to pray as a six, seven, eight-year-old kid by listening to what I thought were older men in our church. They were probably 30 or 40, but I thought they were old. I learned to pray by listening to them pray. My dad brought me to the prayer meeting. I learned to witness to my neighbors by watching my dad just go over with a gift basket to the neighbor and invite them to church. I learned to care for the poor by watching my dad answer the door. It was common in my childhood. And as I look back, we were poor. We lived in northeast Houston. That was not the rich suburb of Houston. That's River Oaks, by the way. If you wonder, that's where the Bushes live. We lived in northeast Houston. That was the hood. People knock on our door. My dad pull out his wallet. Now then I thought, well, it's no wonder we don't have a lot of money. My dad's giving what little we have away. But he cared for the poor. He had a heart for the underdog. I, I, I didn't learn to, to care about people who were addicted by working through a degree in psychology and helping run a, a major uh, recovery center in Tacoma, Washington. That's not where I did that. that. That's not where I learned it. I learned it by my dad letting people who were drunk come into our church service. And I would go and say, Dad, that guy in the back's a mess acting up. Kick him out of here. You see how gracious little Alvin used to be? <laughs> Dad, these people are messing up our service. And you know what my dad would say? He would just smile at me and say, son, I got some guys watching them, and it's a little disruptive. I agree. But he said, you know what, son? What if tonight's the night that that person gets delivered? And as a kid, I saw people in my church come to the altar who were addicted to drugs, who were addicted to alcohol, who were high when they showed up. And I saw them pray and experience deliverance and be transformed, and they were never the same. My dad was consistent. He wasn't perfect, but he was consistent. He lived the life in front of me. Man, we can do that too. I'm encouraging you. My dad's not the super dad. I'm encouraging you, be consistent. Don't shoot for perfection in your walk with Jesus, but shoot for consistency. Let your people know you love Jesus, that you're walking with Jesus. Share your adventure of Jesus with them. And finally, everybody's favorite part of the sermon, the letter E is enjoy. Enjoy. Make sure your kids know, men, that you enjoy being with them and spending time with them. Your kids aren't an interruption to your life of pleasure. Your, your kids aren't uh, another budget item that you have to provide for. Your kids are a gift from God to you. God made you a father. He created you a man. He gave you this wife. He gave you this children. Let them know that you enjoy being their father. I used to say to my kids almost every birthday as they were growing up, I still do sometimes, but almost every year, on their birthday card, after writing something positive, I would say, one of the great joys of my life is being your dad. And you know why I said that? Because the culture is telling kids that you don't matter. The culture is telling kids that you're just another expense. The, the culture is telling kids that your parents are being robbed of leisure time and seeking out more and more pleasure for their selfish lives. The, the culture is saying that kids are here for us to use. And, you know, that's the message they're hearing. And I wanted my kids to know, I don't care what you hear from the culture, you need to know that one of the great joys of my life is having you in this house. Enjoy the time with them. Where do we get that from? We get it from God. You want to hear some Old Testament? Listen to this. Might want to write it down. 
You might not even believe it's in the Old Testament, but it is. Zephaniah 3.17, it's describing God and us. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Do you see that? That's a description of our Heavenly Father who loves us, who's with us. Dads, I want you to hear this this morning. God is with you. He is for you. He created you. He made you a man. He created the idea of marriage. He created the idea of family. And he is for you in your parenting. Don't forget that. And he rejoices and even sings over you. You're not going to get that from the culture, beloved. You're not going to get that on the college or high school campus these days, but you will get it from your Bible. That's who you are. You want to know who you are? We sang about it this morning. You want to know who you are? Get your nose in the Bible. The Bible tells you your identity. The Bible tells you why marriage is important, why staying together is important, why children are important, why raising children in the house and the admonition of the Lord is important. The Bible will tell you that because it's what ultimately matters. Psalm 149, verse 4, listen to this. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. There's a good verse to read during Pride Month. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Sometimes it doesn't seem like we're winning so much, does it? But if you're following Jesus, men, you're on the right team. If you're following Jesus, even though it seems like you might be losing, you're actually winning. Why? Because we are following God. He is our protector. He is our director. He gives us a sense of his presence. And not only that, but he delights in us. Enjoy the time you have with children. Play with your children. I saw the greatest video this week that I've seen in a long time. We're going to finish with this. And that was a, a dad, and there was a, like a wrestling match in the background. I should have brought it this morning so that we could see it, because you probably didn't see it. But this dad's a big macho dad, and this little kid couldn't have been over, could barely walk, maybe was that one and a half, maybe two. And so you had the wrestling stuff going on in the background, and the dad was with this little boy doing a little wrestling and all of a sudden, the, the little boy, he helps him get up on like this dresser. I thought, oh my gosh. And then, then the dad's back down on his back. And all this wrestling commentary, you can tell they played wrestling together before. And this little two-year-old, I thought, okay, he's going to do like off the top rope kind of thing. Ah, that's pretty funny. No, the little two-year-old does a handstand, a flip, and then lands on his dad. <laughs> and his dad helps him count out one, two, three. But do fun stuff with your kids. I thought, there's a dad who has it. There's a dad who just enjoys being with his kids, and, and they know that he enjoys being with them. So here's the test, men. If you know this, we can kind of move on and uh, go home. But if you don't know it, we're going to stay for 15 more minutes and review it. So women, you're, unfortunately, you're having to depend on the men. So men, what's the G stand for? Generous. What's the R stand for? Responsible. What's the A stand for? Aware. What's the C stand for? What's the E stand for? Let's be those kind of dads and granddads, man. Amen? Amen. Stand up this morning. For the benediction today, I was thinking about what kind of benediction we should have for Father's Day. And I love the priestly blessing. That's what we're going to use from number six. And, and the reason I love it is because I, I never get over it. These are God's very words. The, the, the benediction that was given to Moses in the book of Numbers chapter six, if you read the line before it, it says, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, so when you hear these words this morning, these are the words that God himself wants to use to bless you, men and women. Hear these words from God, receive them, 
as we leave today that God is for you, he's with you, he delights over you, he wants to bless you, and you can live in that kind of a relationship with him if you'll choose to do that. Hear these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May God bless and keep you, beloved, until we meet again. And all God's people said... Amen. Hey, I love you. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you next time.